to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Hey, thanks for joining in this week. You know, Colin and I have been talking a lot, and we wanted to create an episode to address the events that happened on January 6th at the U.S. Capitol. In response to those violent events, the Joint Chiefs released a memo to the Joint Force signed by all eight members of the Joint Chiefs. You know, Reed, I don't know that I've ever seen a memo like this from the Joint Chiefs where all eight have signed and it's to the entire Joint Force. I mean, I've seen memos from the chairman of the Joint Chief, but I've never seen something like this. This seems to be out of the ordinary. Yeah, it certainly struck me. The impact of seeing all eight signatures in pen at the bottom of a few short three or four paragraphs definitely lent some weight. You know what I mean? Like it was kind of a a heavy thing. Yeah, for sure. So if you haven't, we invite you to go read that document and take a look. So we've posted a link to it in our show notes. If you just Google JCS memo, you're probably going to see a couple news articles about it. It's, uh, you know, something that a lot of people are taking a look at. Their brief but eloquent memo does not need commentary. The words are crystal clear in what they are trying to convey to us. Yeah. So it is with a great deal of humility that Colin and I recommend that we have a discussion about why that document has such weight and kind of the background and context for their words. You know, Colin, you and I, for those of us who wear the cloth of the nation, we read that and it resonates deeply with us. This is something that makes sense. It's part of our culture. It's how we address problems. This is not, you know, it has that je ne sais quoi. It has something for us. Yeah. We felt that there's a lot of value, though, in trying to describe why that is the case. And I think as you see, you know, as we bring this whole discussion full circle in the back, you'll kind of see why that is. You know, specifically, that memo outlines the importance of civilian control of the military. No less than six times in this, you know, three or four paragraphs do the Joint Chiefs mention defending the Constitution and or somehow submitting to the rule of law. Yeah, I think what the Joint Chiefs are trying to do here is remind us of our place as members of the military, but even more specifically, and it doesn't say this in the memo, but what our role as officers who wear this uniform is with respect to the political process, the events that are transpiring right now in our nation, and trying to provide a very clear, distinct, and succinct vision of what it is that we should be doing in response to everything that's going on. Yeah, and if that doesn't define, you know, the mission and role of a leader, right, defining that vision, um, this is clearly why they're on the JCFs, right? These, these are literally the top of the top when it comes to establishing vision, but they absolutely killed it. Even these guys, this is, this is the top of their game. Yeah. And it's very, very brilliant. Go take a few minutes, take a look at that document. It's just excellent. It really is. Yeah. So you said, Reed, that in this document, no less than six times they talked about the Constitution, defending it, and submitting to the rule of law. But it does beg the question, and this is where we want to have our discussion today, of why would they emphasize that topic so frequently and directly? What does it mean to defend the Constitution? That's an oath that we take to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. But what does that mean in reality? When we talk about civil control of the military, what is that and why does it matter? Why is the military under the direction of people who have no idea what we do? You know, the vast majority of the American people have never served in the military, so why should we be subservient to them? And then finally, in my mind, I'm wondering the so what? Like, why should we care about this as 
individuals as officers in the Air Force or those who want to become one, how should we let this memo and this knowledge about civil control of the military and defending the Constitution guide our actions as we are members of the profession of arms? Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And Colin, I think it's really important to understand that this is not like some B-level philosophical discussion. This is fundamental to our republic. It is fundamental to the entire character and nature of the very constitution that we've sworn to protect. Yeah. It is as important as checks and balances, as having branches of government, as having elections. It, it is that critical. It is that baked in that we, as you'll see, cannot have a functioning democracy without civilian control of the military. Yeah. And our founders were keenly aware of this. And we'll go through some things as we explore, as we go on, but we have to remember where they came from. What was their time and place in the world and in world history? And, you know, they explored in the Federalist Papers and others hundreds of years of experience, not individually, but, you know, collectively history had shown them how important it was to figure out the answer of who's in charge of the people who have the swords. Yeah. Right. Because the American experiment, the civil control of the military was not a widely practiced thing, just like democracy itself wasn't widely practiced. And so most often the control of the military belonged to some authoritarian ruler, be it a monarch or a military dictator or something along those lines. And so trying to set up a nation, a democracy or a democratic republic where civil control of the military could take place was not a foregone conclusion at that point. Yeah. It had never really truly been done. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Colin, you and I, we are not constitutional historians. We are not legal minds. We are just a couple of officers. And I don't want to be, re you know, reductive about that. But we went out and got some knowledge. Um, we're going to put some links to some really great resources that we used as we went throughout our research. And the first is one that I'll be referencing a lot. It's a you know incredibly brilliant essay by Richard Cohen. We'll put a link in the show notes. He does a really good job of really succinctly going through a lot of this stuff. And some of the things that he pointed out is how this idea of who holds control and ultimate power of those who exert physical force has been debated for a really long time. And I guess that makes sense, right, Colin? I mean, whoever has the guns and the planes and the bullets and the knights and the bows and arrows, they can make the rules because they can coerce, they can force. That's the entire point right. of a military force, right, is to exert your will on others. Now, normally we do this by exerting our will on a foreign adversary, Yep. right? And that's the traditional role of a military force. Well, but what if your own house is not in order, right? If things at home aren't good, what is to prevent the people who are practiced and exercised and professional in exerting force from turning in interiorly? Right. And history is replete of hundreds of examples of the nation's military deciding that things at home are not working and, you know, quote, we're from the government, we're here to fix things and taking over. Yeah. And the framers were keenly aware of this. Now, I've read... Ooh, way too many Federalist Papers as I was doing this reading and trying to get ready for this. And it's funny, Colin, they were even concerned not just with who's going to control the military, but should there even be one in peacetime? They were so afraid right. of this concept of a military turning in on the nation and threatening the processes that there was extensive debate about whether or not there should even be a standing military in times of peace. And they eventually settled on the idea pretty much, you know, really advocated by Hamilton that there had to be some sort of very limited standing professional military force, but we have to figure out a way to put a lot of checks and balances on that in order to prevent this exact scenario that we've already outlined. So therein we start to answer the question of why civil control of the military was and is so important in the United States or any democracy for that matter, right? Because when you think about the military, which we have discussed at length you know, in this podcast, especially if you want to go back to our episode on the warrior ethos of an Air Force officer, 
many of the things that the military prizes that we value or the things that are just represented by someone who's wearing the uniform are nearly completely opposite of those things that are valued or represented by a democratic republic. You know, by necessity and even design, militaries are authoritarian. We do fall into a hierarchy and we are insistent on rigid discipline and order. We prize obedience. We value giving up your own personal needs for the good of the whole. But on the other hand, that's not really how democracies function or thrive. Rather, they prize participation in the political process. They like to set up things, democracies like to have things be egalitarian and individualistic, meaning you have the latitude to pursue freedom and independence, do things the way that you see fit, you know, like the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are individual things that democratic societies like ours value. But those are antithetical to what we do in the military. But Richard Cohn has a great line in his essay where he says that the purpose of the military is to defend society, not to define it. So yes, the military has all of these values, but we should not let them force those values on the rest of American society. We should protect. We use what we hold near and dear to us in order to allow the American people to hold on to what's near and dear to them. Yeah, exactly. You know, Cohn goes on to say another great one-liner. While a country may have civilian control of the military without democracy, it cannot have democracy without civilian control. Ooh, right? Like, it's interesting. And there are other nations out there, China, who have civilian control of the military. And that's what he's pointing out. He goes in to describe how this idea of who is in charge of the militaries and how that power is exercised, it is a big deal no matter what form of government you have. But in a democracy, it is absolute. It is a must. Yeah. You must have it. And for all those reasons you described. And I think that's really important to think about is, you know, some of those qualities that we talked about, Colin, right? You said we're obedient in the military. We have hierarchies. We have discipline and order and how those are good things. The key difference is that we willingly submit to those things in order to defend society. Yeah. When we get this flipped around, the other trait we didn't talk about is authoritarianism, mm -hmm. Yep. right? Using its authority to mandate those things, right? Where's the choice in that? And wait a minute, I thought choice and democracy were kind of a thing, right? Isn't that kind of, don't they go together? Isn't that? Yeah, okay, so that's a thing, yeah. right? <laughs> and that's the key. The founders were very aware of this. They were very cognizant of these facts. And in order to create a system keep a standing professional military force and try to ameliorate or assuage the fears, very legitimate, right? Fears of military taking over. And again, if, if, you, if you doubt that this is a thing, just go to Wikipedia, great site, great resource. I donate every year and type military dictatorship and just see the list. It goes on for a while, you know, get your scroll finger ready because it's pretty lengthy. And so they created a system that will help prevent that. And so in order to do this, they created this idea of checks and balances, right? And splitting up the powers. So another paper that we used on the idea of federalism and military power was hosted by Vanderbilt University. And we'll put again, a link in the show notes. And it describes how the framers built the constitution this way. It says horizontally, the framers divided the power of the military between the Congress and the president, both separating functions and providing checks. For example, the Constitution gave Congress the power to raise armies, to provide for a navy, organize the militia, declare war, regulate the armed forces, and to tax and appropriate money for military affairs. The president was made commander-in-chief of the military and had the power to appoint the officers with the Senate consent. So that's how they chose to divide further the military's ability to organize, train, and equip by separating the functions of the execution and the selection of their officers with the executive from 
the organization, the regulation, the equipping with Congress. And yep. as you can see, right, Congress and the president aren't always on the same page, right? Hey, I don't know if this is, you know, I don't know, breaking any, what's the word I'm looking for? Spoiler alert, the Congress and the president aren't always supposed to be on the same page. That was actually like <laughs> built in friction. Yeah. We've talked about that before, right? How like sometimes building in conflict is actually important. This is a situation where they did that on purpose. It's called checks and balances. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So yeah, this was built in in order to help further divide the military's ability to kind of take on an identity in and of itself, right? If we paid for all our own stuff, if we raised all our own money, if we set all our own rules, we could kind of do whatever we want because we have all the guns. And all the people and all the power. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So as you can hear, there's great value in going back and reading these things in the Constitution. If you haven't done it recently, I recommend that you take the 20 minutes because these are not long, difficult documents. But go read the Constitution, especially Articles 1, 2, and 6. Article 1 being about the legislative branch of government, Congress, and its responsibilities toward the military. Article 2 being about the executive or the president. And then I add in Article 6 there because it talks about the Constitution being the supreme law of the land. The military is not the supreme law of the land, but the Constitution is. And so it's worth your time to go take a look at these, see what is actually written down in the Constitution, and consider how these things apply to the military in general, but also to you as an individual. So. What of it all, Reed? Why would we have this 30-minute civics lesson here on a podcast? Why would we spend all this time talking about the Constitution, the framers, the founders, and how it all has come together in the past? That is because how we behave and respond in times like now, in times of war, in times of peace, insurrection or stability, it all relates back to our mandate and oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. It matters because these things help us understand how it is that we should behave in times of war, peace, insurrection, or stability. Everything that we think, say, or do as officers in the Air Force must be filtered through that lens. Exactly. The very commission that we have is what? A commission to execute and act on behalf of the orders of the president as dictated by the Constitution, right? Like the whole fact that we exist and are organized and exist at all is because the Constitution says, therefore, you have power. Yeah. And as a result, you know, Richard Cohen explores this really well in his essay. Again, such a great essay. It's not short, but it's very thorough and very complete. And really enjoyed reading it. He talks about how important this is and how one of the reasons the Constitution is organized the way it was is to bring about an officer corps focused on its own profession, right? So we need to be worried about what we are doing. We need to be thinking about how we are organized and how we practice the art of war and how we acquire technical expertise. Because as he puts it in his words, moreover, this autonomous military profession would make officers politically neutral and less likely to intervene in politics. Why? Because we're too busy doing our actual jobs which is to get good at what we do and focusing on supporting the document that gives us our own power. See, that's the thing. If we subvert, if we think we have power in and of ourselves and we subvert that, we're actually reducing our own power because that's the source of our power. Right. Right? I know that, again, seems circular, but think about it. That's where we get our authority. And we get that authority by the way we execute our job. I think we'll get to that, right? We'll get to that in the end. Let me put it another way that we are as good as we are as a military because we have civil control of the military, not in spite of it. 100%. It is the civil control of the military that enables us. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a really good point, Colin. So here it is. We bring this all back together and let's return to the original reason that we were having this conversation in the first place. The events of January 6th and the attack on the U.S. Capitol, as well as this memorandum that came out from the Joint Chiefs. We have to ask ourselves, when the Constitution of the United States hangs by a thread, 
when it's on the brink of ruin, when it's under attack you know, from any enemy, foreign or domestic, what is our responsibility? We have taken the oath to protect the Constitution, not the political leaders. We haven't sworn an oath to the President of the United States or to Congress or anybody else within the federal government. Our oath is only for the Constitution of the United States. Now, I know that sounds simplistic, but the reality is that defending the Constitution and submitting to civil control is far more complex than that. It's not just, oh, yeah, all we do is protect the Constitution. Obviously, there is so much more. And along those lines, back in October, there was a podcast episode from Radiolab that I found incredibly prescient as far as what could potentially take place as a result of how the election could go or how it did go. You know, they asked the question of what would happen in the event of a disputed election. And I thought that was really interesting, especially like kind of how it came about. You know, there was this lady, Rosa Brooks, who was at a, you know, a Washington, you know, Beltway dinner kind of thing where the conversation came up about like what would happen in the event that the election is unclear that you know we don't have a outright winner and what would happen in that type of circumstance and the conversation at the dinner table there where rosa brooks basically said well that would never happen there would absolutely be a clear winner because the military would make it so and you know a little bit more background about rosa brooks reed you're actually a huge fan of her so why don't you you know explain a little bit about how that conversation went yeah, so Rosa Brooks is a, a lawyer who was appointed to work at the Pentagon under the Obama administration. And as she outlines in her book, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, highly recommended read. Little legalese, but still very, very interesting. She explores how some of her first memories as a child were protesting the Vietnam War, how she grew up thinking the military was a horrible institution. And when she was put at the Pentagon, her like explicit intent was to dismember the entire institution. And yet she left yeah. married to a special forces officer and is now a big fan of the military. So yeah. long story short, she hears this response, right? She hears this response of, oh, the military will take care of it. And her, you know, visceral reaction is like, hang on. <laughs> is that really their job? Is that what they're supposed to do, right? Her whole book that I previously mentioned explores this idea of what should the role of the military be. It's really interesting. And so she decides to host a war game. Now, war games are something that we've used, you know, for centuries in the military to play out scenarios. Very often these are done on tabletops. They're done with actual game pieces. They outline rules. And the point is to explore, to create thought experiments for how would people act, what strategies would work. And, you know, she does a really good job outlining how this war game happened in the podcast episode. But she collected you know, some really high power military, Washington, White House, you know, lawyers and professors, like really high power people, you know, to do this war game. Yep. And it's time compressed, you know, so this doesn't take place in real time, right? You're like, okay, two days go by and then we have another decision point, you know, so it kind of goes fast. So you can kind of play out a large campaign, if you will. Each team has moves, each team has sides, there's adjudicators, you know, it's a very careful process. You know, don't think, you know, Candyland, you know, it's way more complicated than that. It's more like risk, right? Ooh, but with a really big board and really big rules, <laughs> you know, it's funny. <laughs> Go listen to the episode. It's called What If, and it's by Radiolab, and it actually sounds a little bit boring until it gets going. But anyway, having done some war games, they can be a little onerous, but it's the insights you glean, which are really fascinating. You know, a lot of detailed planning, which is enabled by intelligence. You create repeatable processes. Anyway, the war games that they played revealed that in the end of these scenarios, in some form or fashion, the United States military would end up deciding the election. And that's a really... Go listen to the episode. It's not as simple as, you know, like <laughs> the Joint Chiefs stood up and said, yay, verily, I have declared that so-and-so is the winner. It's much more nuanced than that, and that's what we're going to talk about. In this specific scenario that they explored, when the Joint Chiefs handed the nuclear codes to the elected president, 
that was kind of the thing that decided it. And yeah. And that seems like such a simple, I mean, it's not simple, right? They're the nuclear codes, but the act, right? It wasn't grandiose. It wasn't public. It's just executing their delegated mission. And I think that's kind of where we want to start getting to, right, Colin? This, this idea that, well, what does it mean that the U.S. military decided the election? And we're not saying that that's happening now, but we are a little bit, and we'll kind of get to that. So, Colin, why don't you take us to that next step, right? How does that episode connect to where we are now? Yeah, I mean, because why would the military have to give up the nuclear codes to a president? Well, because of everything that we just have been talking about, that we submit to civil control of the military. And if you've got the, you know, whoever possesses control of the ultimate destructive power in the known universe, that's the person who's in charge. If you got all the bombs, you're the person who runs the show. Well, so the Joint Chiefs should not be the ones who are running the show. It should be the president. And so just the simple act of handing over the nuclear codes is submitting to civil control. It's doing exactly what the Constitution requires, that the president of the United States, a civilian, be the commander-in-chief of the military by possessing the nuclear codes. And I personally think, and we can talk about this, Reed, maybe you feel differently, but I think that this memo that just came out from the Joint Chiefs is the fulfillment of that, that because of everything that happened at the Capitol and the response to it, asking what is the role of the military in this type of situation, and they're sending out this memo that says President-elect Biden will be inaugurated and become our 46th commander-in-chief, they are in effect saying, here are the nuclear codes. You are the commander-in-chief. I don't know. What do you think, Reed? I'm getting chills a little bit. I mean, because what that document is saying is, hi, we're the eight arguably most powerful men controlling the most powerful military force the history has ever known. But, comma, we are following the Constitution. We are ceding that power as it should be, controlled to the appropriate civil authorities. And we are going to support the constitutional process that has been outlined. And that's all they're saying. But it's so much more, right? We just explored why it's so much more. And hopefully, Colin, today we've kind of shown our audience why when you and I read that memo, it just resonated so deeply with us. Yeah. This is not, you know, and that's kind of where we're going next, right? Is the so what, right? There's a couple things we could take away from this, this idea. First, any one of us, Colin, in theory, have the potential to be one of these joint chiefs. You know, whether that's in reality or to be the flight commander or, you know, in some other position of authority. Yep. You have to be ready for your turn at bat. We've said that over and over again on this podcast, right? When the time comes, what are you going to do? The time came for the chairman and they knew exactly what to do. They knew exactly what to do because that's why they got to be where they are. It's because they're operating at the top of their game. You know, another thing we wanted to talk about is... This is not the decision of eight men. This is not just them. This is an expression of the collective will of every single member of the United States Armed Forces. That's what that memo said. And that, I think, is really something to think about. Yeah, it's incredibly humbling to think about how the people who wear the uniform of the United States who care deeply about how the election plays out and who is ultimately their commander in chief saying, we will honor the result of the election, no matter what it is. And we will pass you the keys to the kingdom or the nuclear codes or whatever you want to call it. We will give you that authority because we submit as a collective whole, all members of the military, officers enlisted warrant and here lead us you are the person who is responsible for all of our welfare and our ability to carry out the mission yeah it's so amazing to think about yeah and the other thing that we wanted to talk about is that this is not a finite decision this memo 
they did not sit around the eight of them like, okay, what are we going to do now? There was no question what they were going to do now because this was the result of norms established over their entire career, over the entire you know, history of our nation. The exercise of power creates norms. We, members of the military, exercise power. Therefore, we create norms. These norms are not written down a lot of times, but they drive a significant portion of what you know, our day-to-day looks like in this country. That's the question. What norms do we want to establish? And do you want to be responsible for creating? Yeah, so I think you and I have some norms that we want to present here to our audience. Because if we want a peaceful transition to be a norm, we have the responsibility of creating that norm. That's our responsibility, is to enable and support the peaceful transition of power from one administration to the next. And we do that by having the norm, by participating in and supporting the norm of being apolitical. Now, when I say apolitical read, I'm not talking about that you shouldn't participate, that you shouldn't have opinions or that you shouldn't participate in the political process. Absolutely, you should. You are a citizen of the United States. You have the responsibility of being a participant in all of these things. But being apolitical does mean that when you are in uniform, that you are informed. Be informed. That's something that we care deeply about, which is why we do this podcast and specifically this episode. Be informed. But with that information, still be obedient. Yes, there is a time and place for you to push back a little bit on different things, and there is a political process for getting things changed, but we expect obedience. Not just expect, we insist on it, right? Yeah, it's part of the cost of entry, you know? And that goes back to one of our other episodes, and our next B is be disciplined. This is hard to like keep your emotions in check and be thoughtful and deliberate, but that's the cost of entry. We expect discipline. We expect that of the men and women who wear the cloth of the nation. Yeah, so when you find that your emotions are running high, don't run toward where all of the political rallies are taking place. Go someplace else, stay away. Yeah. Be disciplined. Yeah, which leads me to the next B, Be excellent. We have a higher standard that we expect of the people who wear this uniform. Be excellent. Go do some reading. Sit down with your peers. Have these discussions. Listen. Be excellent. You know, and the last one before we'll turn it over to you to call them to wrap up is be worthy. Be worthy of the name, the United States that you wear on your chest. Be worthy of that name. Because we the ones with a significant portion of the power, create the norms. And what norms do we want to create? What do you want to be responsible for creating? Yeah, and I would also say, be worthy of the Constitution, which is the document that provides you your authority. Special trust and confidence is placed in you by the Constitution through the President of the United States confirmed by the Senate. That is the source of your commission, the source of your authority, be worthy of it. And that is how you will support and defend the Constitution, is by doing these things. Be informed, be obedient, be disciplined, be excellent, and be worthy. Yeah, great rundown, Colin. You know, with all the tragedy that was the 6th of January, I also want to convey my confidence because we still fulfilled the obligation, the Congress still fulfilled their obligation to ratify and to certify the results of Electoral College. So, yes, it was an awful, horrible, no good, very bad thing. But the process is still happening. And so this is where I'm going to take a quick opportunity to break something to our audience that I've not been talking about to this point. And that is for the last year, I have actually been working at the White House for a significant portion of my duty day. I'm a liaison from my agency to the White House to make sure the members of the National Security Council are getting the information they need from my agency. I am in no way involved in anything political or even domestic. Everything I do is outwardly focused towards foreign adversaries. I was at the White House on Friday the 8th, two days after. And the mood was somber. Many people that I worked directly with had left in protest. It was not a happy time, but the government continued to function. And 
what I'm going to leave my year at the White House with is a very high confidence in the brilliance and the strength of the system, despite the failings of people. You know, Colin, all of these systems, right, they're made up of these fleshy meat bags that are called human beings, and we make mistakes, we have emotions, we lose our tempers, we forget emails, and, you know, people at the White House are no different. I've gotten emails with spelling errors, Colin, from the White House, you know? What? Like, yeah, people are people. <laughs> And I don't want to be flippant or reductive. You know, I recognize this is a pretty heavy topic. But what I want the audience to take away is that I've been in the room where it happens sometimes. And the system that our founders established is brilliant. It is brilliant. It is strong. It's robust. But it's still made up of people and our individual decisions. And I just want to relay that confidence. You know, it was a really rough week. Promise, I know, but I'm leaving confident that we are in a good place. And this memo absolutely 100% solidified and really bolstered that confidence. Yeah, for sure. Yes, people make mistakes, but by and large, even at the highest levels of government, even at the highest concentrations of power for our nation, those people who make mistakes have our best interest at heart. They really, truly want to do the best thing for the majority of Americans. Now, you may disagree with how they go about it, but it's pretty rare that you're going to find anybody at that level of government who does not love America, who does not want to do the best thing for us all. And so as members of the military, we owe them those different B's that we just talked about. We owe them the control that the Constitution requires over the military. We must submit to that. Regardless of who gets elected and is in these different positions of power this year, next year, or any time in the future, we owe them our support. But even more than that, as we've been saying here, we owe it to the Constitution because that is the document and the source of all of these things for us. It is because of the Constitution that we are able to have civil control of the military. And because we have civil control of the military, the profession of arms as we know it is able to exist and not only exist, but thrive in everything that we do. I think, Colin, that's a pretty good place to leave it. Yep. You know, I think we've conveyed the importance in the sanctity of that document and our responsibility to it. Hey, audience, really appreciate you joining us this week. We recognize that, you know, tough times are here and have been here and are going to be here for the future. But we are confident because of you. We are confident because of your excellence. We're confident because of the things that you are doing on behalf of the nation. We're proud to serve alongside you. Hit us up on social media. Send us an email if you have any questions. We're happy to do our best to answer them. Again, not constitutional history, legal experts, you know, just a couple officers really trying to do the best they can to understand what it means to be a member of the profession of arms and be a commissioned officer in that. Thank you for joining us on your journey. Is there anything else, Colin, before we wrap up this week? I just echo exactly what you're saying. Thank you to our audience for listening in, for learning with us. We really want you to participate in this process with us. Make us better as we try to do the same for you. I think we'll leave it there. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Yeah.